we're not here only to ask, but to give. And we believe that contributing to the relationship is uh, terribly important. Business of Architecture, episode 342. Hello, and welcome back, Architect Nation. I'm Enoch Sears, and this is the show where you'll discover tips, strategies, and secrets for building an architecture practice that lets you do your best work more often. Today, we speak with the founder of a firm that was named the number one design firm in the United States by Architect Magazine in 2019. Their work has won over 100 national, regional, and local awards, including four national AIA awards, as well as several international design competitions, all in less than 25 years. Victor F. Trey Trahan III, FAIA, is an American philanthropist and the founder and design principal of Trahan Architects, which has offices in New Orleans and New York City. Trey established Trahan Architects at the age of 32, and the firm has since designed a series of domestic and international projects that have received global recognition. Today, I'm pleased to have Trey Trahan on the podcast to share with us his journey, the ethos, the challenges, and the successes that have helped him build his 35-person firm. Trey, welcome to the Business of Architecture podcast. So nice to be here, Enoch. Um, thank you for the invitation. It's a privilege. Absolutely. I'm curious, what have you seen? Because right now we're about six months into the pandemic, COVID-19, and I'm curious to know what you've seen because of this. There was a lot of anxiety I know a lot of people had going into this about how it was going to affect the architecture industry. Yeah, I, you know, I think, um, I think I know for myself and my colleagues, I see um, a focus towards others, um, uh, a focus on a much broader community, thinking less about ourselves and thinking about um, um, the pain that many individuals and families are going through. But at the same time, um, thinking about um, maybe, maybe we needed this type of of jolt, and maybe we will emerge out of this um, significantly better as a society and thinking about privileging things that uh, maybe over time had kind of fallen to the bottom of what we deeply care about and and uh, invest in daily. And um, so I'm terribly optimistic about the future and um, am looking forward to um, embracing the complexities that that um, that come out of this but also the opportunities that is a it's a beautiful frame it's really inspiring to hear that and especially when we look at it seems like these times of of compression out shall we say a lot of times have produced innovation have produced giant leaps forward either from a business perspective or from a culture perspective yeah I um, when you read about history and you think about um, especially in the South, uh, these types of conditions that, of course, occur throughout history, um, whether it's the stock market or social issues, um, all of us can emerge out of this um, uh, much more respectful of a different set of objectives. And even maybe our aspirations should, should change. Um, I know for us, it's affected the culture of the firm. It's affected our conversations daily. It's affected how we, um, I think, define beauty um, and how we think about expanding the role of an architecture firm. I have, for so many years, felt like an architecture firm was somewhat insular and in a, um, a predetermined silo and not that, um, that practice isn't um, contributing to the community in many ways, but I think it's much more than that. And I like thinking about those things. What are some of the thoughts that you have on that right now? Yeah, well, in Louisiana, as you know, we, we deal with um, issues of flooding and climate change. And so we as a firm are talking a lot about conservation and investing in conservation, um, how art can ref respond to these issues maybe even art that measures climate change, maybe art that um, even contributes to biodiversity. Um, but 
specific to Louisiana, you know, there's a history of plantations and slavery. And um, so the discussions we're having is how do we behave today? How do we practice today? Um, how have all those complex issues and marginalized people those times um, influence the way we think, the way we treat each other, the way we build, the way we see uh, the law and think about the law? And um, I like expanding the conversation in the office to include um, a much broader set of issues such as these. Mm, got it. Now, from a business side, what have you seen uh, in terms of the pandemic and the collateral damage, either either less business, more business? What does that look like for you guys? Yeah. For us, I say this with tremendous humility and respect. We're having one of our best years ever. Um, Great to some hear. Of that, yeah, some of that is because we are not dependent on certain typologies that are taking a beating. Um, and in all fairness, we have one project that's in a little over a half a billion in construction costs, which is a uh, renovation of Louisiana Superdome, um, which is a tremendous project that's moving forward in, in spite of the pandemic. Uh, the client group is um, an incli incredible client, and they are working really hard to keep the thing moving and recognizing the impact the Superdome has had on our community as the kind of community living room. Um, we were the lead architects on the dome after Katrina. And I personally witnessed that, that night when the Saints played the Atlanta um, Falcons. Um, uh, we won, of course. Um, what it was like for a community to feel a sense of, of, of pride in that uh, the city would return and potentially even much better. And uh, so we're participating in that, but quite frankly, we are of recent been invited to participate in a number of international competitions to submit our credentials for everything from a church in Manhattan um, to um, a number of other projects, low-income housing projects, uh, a very, di very diverse typologies. And so um, things appear to uh, be moving in the right direction for us, um, which, which you know, is is exciting on one level, um, but on another, it you can't help but think of others that that are really struggling during these times. Sure, I'm, I'm always interested to know how someone's childhood affects their path later in life, both from an entrepreneurial perspective and what they end up doing with their career. What were some of the key childhood experiences, if you wouldn't mind sharing, that kind of made you the person who you are today? Yeah, that is that is a beautiful question. So I grew up in South Louisiana. My father's French. My mother's Czechoslovakian. Uh, I grew up where there was a bayou behind the house, and every time there was a significant uh, a storm, uh, the bayou flooded, and it flooded uh, a larger uh area of, of lowlands, and my mother would say, don't go play in the bayou, and of course I did. And, um, but that kind of seasonal experience uh, influenced me. I also remember playing along the bayou and watching a crop duster from the rice fields um, uh, move across the bayou and turn off the nozzle that was on the belly of the plane. And even as a kid thinking, there's something not healthy about what is what is spewing out of that nozzle. Um, but then also, my father grew, graduated in geology. My mother was a teacher. Um, as a geologist, we talked a little bit about uh, landforms and those things, but he moved to, his father had a dairy. And so my father was the type that occasionally would come home and say, um, I'm gonna build a greenhouse, a million square foot greenhouse, and grow hydroponic tomatoes. Or I bought a farm, and I think that with the price of rice and um, and the cost of land, we can buy this farm, and the crop will share the crop with a, the adjacent property owner farmer, and we'll share the profits. And so he was always dabbling in. Um, an auto parts store, a grocery store. Um, uh, restaurants, 
And there seemed to be no real limitation to what he was willing to kind of pursue. And it's not like my parents had a lot of money, but he just acted on his curiosity. And he was confident in that. And um, I like doing that. I like feeling, um, I like the pursuit of things that are directly related to architecture, but at times on, on the peripheral and even beyond. And, and seeking to understand how they contribute to society and can participate in our built environment in some way. Right now you have a team of 35 people and maybe growing, especially with the good year that you're having right now. A lot of architects, you know, they struggle to get past two to three people. Uh, they struggle to get past five. Getting past 10 is quite an accomplishment. What do you think for you has been the key of being able to grow the practice just in terms of the size? So I'm using the people as a, a significant factor because let's face it, that means you have a certain project size, you have a certain project scope. But in addition, actually doing the, the level of work that you do, which is very, very design oriented, very fantastic from a design perspective, you've been won numerous awards. What does it take to yeah. do that? You seem to be living the architect's dream. Trey, I want you to bring me behind the curtain. Yeah. Um, well, look, I've, thank you for the compliments, but I've made so many mistakes. And um, I, I, I unfortunately didn't work for one of the real greats. I stayed in South Louisiana, and me and many people um, in years past have pulled that sled up the hill, so to speak. Um, I believe it's about conviction um, and passion, but I also believe it's about quality people. Um, I, I, I can say this honestly, we are really great collaborators and we have arrived at a place where we embrace not losing control but accepting that as architects. Um, it's probably best to set our narcissism aside and accept that um, listening to others, privileging the voice of others, um, is not only a beautiful learning experience for oneself, um, but that can take a project to a place so far beyond one individual's um, control and understanding of responding to a problem. I, what I really, um, and I think what's influenced that is um, I'm, I collect Japanese ceramics and I've, I've become I think friends with Reku Kichizimon 15, the Reku family in Kyoto, and another Japanese ceramicist, uh, Shiro Tutsumira. And what's beautiful about what they do is they retrieve from the soil the clay, and they shape it, but with the understanding that they're going to gift the clay, that shaped chawan or tea bowl, they're going to gift it to the kiln. And there's a high degree of unpredictability to the kiln and its process. And so there's something really celebratory when you open the kiln door and find uh, either many, many, many average pieces, but one glorious piece. And I think as architects, we should think um, more about creating conditions where um, unpredictability and, 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 and uh, reducing the control we want to have over things can create something far beyond our human limitations. Um, and we're exploring some of those concepts right now. Mm, fascinating. In the early days, what was it that caused you to start your own firm? Was that something you'd always wanted to do, something you stumbled into, or something else? You know, um, I didn't know. I was, I was a cut up in high school. My parents didn't think I'd go to college when I left to go to LSU. My father said he looked at my mother and said he'll be back in six weeks working on a farm. Not that there's anything wrong with that. In fact, there's something really beautiful. But um, I had a high school teacher that embraced my interest in architecture, and it just elevated my understanding a little bit. And so when I, um, when I arrived at LSU, I kind of, I think I did well. And that, you know, builds a young kid's, young adult's um, confidence. And, and I think I just continue to push and build on that. You know, there's something to be said when someone has 
um, and I think I have the most incredible parents. I think it was my behavior. Um, maybe not the highest expectations of oneself. Uh, there's a desire to uh, maybe prove yourself, and um, and I wanted to. And so, at a certain point, I had worked for another firm for a few years, and um, and just was really interested in in it, it kind of expressing myself artistically, but also the business of architecture is a fascinating business, and there's a tremendous complexity to it, right? Uh, it's an artistry where, um, in some ways, you can design a process that we apply to all problem solving, but it is, in some ways, reinventing the wheel over and over. And, um, and I love that. It, and I'm still deeply passionate about it many years later. Mm. And can you give me a glimpse into those early days? What was it like to start out a practice? What was your first commission? How did you make pay the bills, shall we speak, yeah. during those early days? It can often be tough. Yeah, so I remember um, pursuing work during the day and, and, um, and picking up engineering firms' red lines at night. That's when uh, there was some drafting taking place, and that's how I kind of paid the bills. Um, and then there was a project that was announced at LSU, the Center for Advanced Microstructures and Devices, uh, a particle accelerator. And, and I remember thinking, for now there's a project that is advertised that I'm on equal ground with all of the competitors in that no one knows a thing about this building type. Mm -hmm. And so researched who nationally and internationally had worked on a building of this type. And there was a firm in Chicago by the name of Lester B. Knight. And um, kind of did, to be, I think, rather honest, a little schmoozing of them, used the perception of Louisiana to my benefit, um, called Lester B. Knight up and said, look, um, I think we have the right relationships and we're going to receive local support and I'd like you to sign an exclusive with us. And they did. And Beautiful. I love yeah, that story. And, 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 and they, we really rode their coattail because they were the only yeah. ones in the country that had worked on this type of building. Now, just that story, and thank you for that anecdote, which is just beautiful little peek into one of your early successes. I would imagine that as you've grown the practice that taking that strategic approach, I'm guessing has probably been something that, that has been your modus operandi. In other words, looking at the people, the players, um, getting to know them. You mentioned pursuing work. So I'd like to get an understanding of that. In what way do you pursue work? Because it's one thing to get that particle accelerator. It's another yeah. thing to continue on that success and lead a team of amazing people and get wonderful commissions that allow you guys the, the opportunity to design. Yeah, great question. Um, for years, we responded to RFPs, um, whether they were state, federal, and um, not that that's a waste of time, but the percentages are low. And so there was a shift when um, a landscape architect on a national level brought to my attention, or I realized that his clients were not only his clients, but his friends. And I remember thinking, wow, how is he building such long-term relationships with clients and it's because I saw them simply as just clients and he saw them as relationships and that was a significant shift I remember my thinking changing when mm -hmm. interviewing I would even in interviews by saying look even if we're not right for this project and not selected please feel um, the privilege of calling me personally and asking for my advice. Um, we're not here only to ask, but to give. And we believe that contributing to the relationship is, is uh, terribly important. And so um, I, that was just a significant shift. And it, it's, much, it's much more authentic, right? As opposed to feeling as if you're selling and asking, as opposed to approaching it with, I'm interested in you as a person, your family, your business, and I'd like to contribute in some meaningful way. And I hope what emerges out of that is a business relationship. And if not, that's okay also. 
Were there any stages, looking back at your path and your journey of getting to where you are today, were there any critical junctures where you felt like, uh, you kind of mentioned one there, understanding that distinction of relationships and friendships. Any others that come to mind that you feel really pivotal in your journey and have helped you make you the man and the leader you are today? Absolutely. Um, in in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, we received a call. To, a father, a Donald Blanchard, was interviewing many architects for a church. And, and I remember he um, scheduled a meeting, an interview with me personally in his office. And in the interview, he asked a series of questions. And at the interview, he said, Trey, I'm going to recommend to the building committee that we select you. And, and I said, why, Father? I said, we've never done a church. And he said, because of that. He said, you bring no preconceived ideas to this process. And I've interviewed many other architects, and they had the church designed in their minds. And I remember thinking, this is so in conflict with every other interview I've had where it was the number, not the quality or the attitude. Um, and so what happened is um, that learning of Catholic Church doctrine, believe it or not, taught us about the decision to commit to anything. And it's not limited to religion or uh, spiritual beliefs. It's limited. I mean, it's, it's, it's everything. When you leave your house, you cross a pretty magical threshold into the public realm, and it's because you're committing to something else. And, um, and so that process and that understanding of threshold, decision-making, conviction, journey, um, is in some way imbued in each of our projects. And a very interesting story I'd like to share is we're interviewing for Auburn University's, the master plan of Auburn University's stadium. And 10 minutes into the interview, the athletic director, David Housel, stopped. And it's a room full of people, associate ADs, coaches. And he said, Trey, um, I have to ask you, um, I, I understand you design some religious spaces, churches, synagogues, and I said, yes. He goes, do you, do you enjoy those? And I said, I do. And he, he said, uh, well, speak to me about, you know, the forecourt on a church. And I did. And then he said, then speak to me about entering the church, that kind of portal. And I did. And I'm thinking, my goodness, we have no shot at this stadium master plan edition. He's eaten up all my time. Maybe he belongs to a church and he wants to hire us for a church. And he, and and Nick, he goes on and on for maybe 15 minutes asking me questions. And then he said, and then you arrive in the sanctuary and people, the community gather around the Holy of Holies. And I said, yes, sir. And he said, uh, and he kept challenging me. And then finally, he walked up to the window and he pulls his curtain open. And he says, there's Jordan Hare Stadium. There's our cathedral. What you just described is a beautiful analogy of tailgating, entering the vomitory, uh, in the SEC, gathering around the field. And he said, it's the same exact thing. And he said, there's no greater religion in the South than SEC football. And we were selected, <laughs> but it was a beautiful uh, analogy. Great. What, what have you found to be the challenges about dealing with team members and getting everyone to row in the same direction? Yeah. I think it's, um, I think it's important to... Um, it's, it's not only about um, team members' past work, their convictions, what their personal interest is, um, their attitude, um, bringing humility, but also, I think, allowing people to express their unique voice. And, and as the architect and at times the leader, um, believing that there's something embedded in a thought Someone may not use the architect's language, um, but they're speaking to something that is meaningful to them and, and, and caring enough um, to carry those thoughts with you and reflect back upon them until you fully understand uh, whether it's just um, an assertive interrogation of their thought to thinking about it more and more, but um, looking for what is embedded in uh, all of the contributors' voices or views, thoughts um, that is meaningful to them and and how it can participate in design or a response to a problem. 
Beautiful. And what's next for Trahan Architects? What's the vision? Where would you like to see the future hold for you and the team? That, that's a great question. I, I feel like we're growing. I think we're expanding the team. Um, we've, we've doubled in the past year and a half, uh, which has been interesting. Um, the conversations, as I've mentioned, have changed. Um, I hope it's not because I'm getting old, um, but because I believe that um, what I thought influenced or informed architecture uh, was limited and that there's much more out there that should influence architecture. And it's, it's beyond technology. Um, to me, it is about people. Um, I'm really excited about our interest in, in, um, in pursuing the truth of marginalized people and understanding and hopefully believing that it can bring some peace to a pretty conflicted world. Um, and so I'm, I'm excited about that because I think it will not elevate, not only elevate us as humanitarians, but it'll elevate our architectural um, knowledge about um, where where built works came from and what influenced them and maybe how they were set on a trajectory. The built work is set on a trajectory based on two or 300 years past that maybe we can go back to those times and challenge um, to think maybe a little differently. And maybe there's a different trajectory to return to, point of origin. Yeah. I felt, so you mentioned caring for marginalized people and understanding that and how that relates to what we do as architects and definitely at the forefront of a lot of the um, conversation now in the United States of America. Now, I had the opportunity to live in Houston a bit, traveled a bit in the South, and generally the South is known as having, let's say, more racial tensions than other parts of the country. And as growing up as a, as a white youth in Louisiana, how did that experience and your experience with people of color or people of other nationalities, the differences, um, how did that influence your current view on what it means to be human and, and wanting to be a proponent of uh, equality and, and the things that you stand for? Yeah, I think it's significant. I mean, you're... You may not speak it, and others may not speak it, but you're aware when, um, when your African American friends. I mean, you, it's it's known. You feel it. You sense it that they feel that they are treated significantly less. You feel that they feel that their opportunities are significant less. And I think when you're really young. Um, my thoughts were, it's hard on all of us. Um, but I now can look back and reflect, and I've had opportunities that others have not. And I'm uncomfortable with that. And, and um, you know, quite frankly, I'm pretty sick and tired of all this. Um, how can you not find yourself in a place where all this racial tension is... Um, impactful to how you feel about um, life and people and want to do something about it. And I think with that, that um, I think some of the things that we are embarking upon are, are going to be extremely controversial. Um, I'm going to be potentially loved by some and not so loved by others. But I think as a white male in the South, um, I think that's where the opportunity lies to to have a strong voice and 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 um, expose myself to um, that type of criticism and I'm okay with that mm. well Trey it's been a pleasure and it, it's let's face it very difficult to capture a lifetime of work and experience in a 30 or 40 minute interview. But as we finish up here, I, I'd just like to ask you, uh, do you think that there's a question that I should have asked you that I didn't? Something that you think is unique about you or, or a message that you have or something that I, I may have overlooked if you were on this side of the, the yeah. microphone? Well, I, I, you know, that's a great question. Uh, what I found is that um, 
the painful times in life are what influence us the most. And, and um, because those are the times that bring us um, to a place that is atypical of our daily lives. And um, I think a lot about those times. Um, so I think the question maybe to ask is, you know, what, what, what experience in life um, brought you to your knees and, and, and how did you emerge out of that? And how is that present in your life today? Um, I enjoy asking that question of others because I find um, that those are the most impactful times. Yeah, agreed. And if I may ask, what would be that moment for you? Yeah, um, older sister of 15 months, um, beautiful woman, one day starts feeling poorly. To make a long story very short, within two weeks they told her she had colon cancer. Two weeks after that she got married. Two weeks after that she died. And so wow. at 31 years old, in 29 days, she died. And um, that loss is painful, right? Um, but I have to tell you, at this point in life, I look back and see it as a tremendous gift. Um, I almost feel privileged to have been given that gift of loss. Um, because what it can, if you choose, result in is a degree of empathy and compassion that is far beyond the empathy and compassion you have had prior to such an experience. Thank you for sharing that with us and the impact that it's had on your life. Thank you, Enoch. It's been a privilege. Likewise. Take care. And that's a wrap. If you enjoyed today's show, please head on over to iTunes and leave us a review. I read every single one. Also, I'd love to get your feedback on this particular episode or the show in general, as well as your recommendations. You can reach us by emailing podcast at businessofarchitecture.com. This podcast is brought to you by Business of Architecture, a leading architect business consultancy. Access our free training on how to structure your architecture firm for more freedom, fulfillment, and financial success by going to smartpracticemethod.com. The views expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the host, and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, warranty, pledge, contract, bond, or commitment, except to help you conquer the world. Carpe diem.